Okay, so here we are with the Pulsar Modular 455, P455 side cart plug-in. Now this is modeled after a API, a classic API desk uh, that lots of famous albums are recorded on and very revered for its sound. Um, and part of that desk, what's called a side cart, um, like a section of the desk, is owned by Mark Daniel Nelson, who's a well-known uh, mix engineer, producer, and he worked with Pulsar Modular um, to develop this, and they spent over a year working on it, which is pretty uh, significant amount of time. And But I have to say, what they've achieved here um, the coding is it's spectacularly good in my view. It's one of a very small handful of of plugins which are now getting have gotten across that line um, into getting into what you could call the analog magic side of things. So I'll just talk briefly about about that, my views on that. So um, I think there's a lot of talk around about analog sounding, you know, better than digital or different. You can't quite get it to sound the same and all that kind of thing. So I learned to mix in an all analog studio recording to tape and mixing to tape. And I know that sound really, really well. And I, I you know, I worked in studios that had the treasure trove of classic gear, you know, all the kind of classic uh, names that we know. And I know the sound of of analog gear really well and my view is that it's not like a panacea it's not that it all sounds great and that it always makes things sound better it can sound really great and certain pieces of gear used in the right way do bring something pretty amazing to the sound that hasn't necessarily been until recently captured in digital but that is not necessary to get great mix. It's something that's a nice thing to have. You can get a different but equally good result in the digital world. There are equally great sounds, I think, in the digital world. But it isn't to say that that sound that analog can bring at its best isn't really nice. It is really nice and it can sound really great and it is nice to have in your, your toolkit. But absolutely not something you're going to get out of, in my view, any piece of analog gear. And a lot of pieces of analog gear will take away rather than give and, and won't necessarily improve the sound. It might even make it, quite likely, make it sound even worse. A lot of pieces of gear that either weren't as well maintained or maybe not quite as well designed that might shine in one particular situation, but the rest of the time really just made things sound less distinct, added noise, uh, and the saturation it added didn't really help. It took away, especially when things start to stack up and you've got a signal going through three or four pieces of gear and each one adding saturation and noise. By the end of it, you really didn't always end up with a great result. And it's very nice in the digital world to have all of that mush, as we used to call it, taken out of the picture. But having said all of that, all that negative stuff about analog gear, there's also things you can gain from analog gear. There is, if used skillfully in the right way, it can do some wonderful things. And there is a sound that you can get from analog gear, which is very hard until recently to be reproduced in the digital world, as I said. And there are certain pieces of gear which just had that, you could call magic kind of thing that it did to the music. And sometimes gear in combination would do that as well if you got it right. So yeah, I don't think that analog gear is a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some pieces that could impart some really wonderful sounds. Very hard to get in the digital world. And this is one of those plugins, very f small handful of plugins that has managed to bring that sound into the digital world. And that I think is a tremendous accomplishment um, and if you like that sound, it can be a real boon to your workflow, I think. Uh, it's really hard to get that in the digital world. Again, I don't think it's necessary. And there are many, many amazing mixes done without that. But it's also a really nice thing to have. I can really only think of a couple of other pieces that even get into this territory. I don't know how they've done it. It's some real kind of coding uh, magic, some real coding voodoo going on here. Um, 
So, yeah, the huge hats off and kudos to them for managing to do this. So I'm going to start without this in and then I'm going to bring it in. And I want you to just, I mean, it is subtle, but that's what you get from analog gear. This analog magic people talk about, it. it's subtle. So we're listening for weight, density, um, sound stage, like what is a stereo image doing and what's the, the relationship of the instruments to you in 3D space, that kind of thing. And the kind of texture of like the mid range and highs and lows. So I'm going to start with it out and I'm going to bring it in and just pay attention to those kind of differences. This is on the two bus, so you're hearing the whole mix go through it. So start with it out. So what I hear with this is various different things. There is a low end bump. You can hear that. Um, so it's adding some low end, even though the EQ is flat. Um, but that is what the hardware does. But beyond that, it sounds that the low end sounds um, tighter and punchier. It sounds like it's got more weight, more impact to it. If you listen to the kick drum and the bass, the sound of the bass, together they just have this kind of more impactful, um, weightier uh, punch to them. So just, I'm gonna talk about the other elements in a minute, but just have a listen to that just for a moment. Start with it out and bring it in. You hear what I mean by that um, pulling together of the kick drum and the bass into this kind of, um, it's not like statically just boosted or something like that. And it's not compressed in an obvious way, but it's pulled together and given impact and weight. And that's a really nice effect. And that is the kind of thing that you get from a really great piece of analog gear. Um, often the kind of thing you'd add in mastering as well if it wasn't there in the original mix. So we'll listen again and this time have listened to the mid-range. So listen to the difference in, in the snare. Um, there's more punch to the snare. The mids of the snare are a little bit more present. Um, but almost more important than that to me is you listen to the horn. And with the plugin engaged, the, the, it just has a velvety texture to it, a really nice, smooth, velvety texture. Uh, and it's brought more forward, more uh, in a kind of lush way, it's moved forward. Um, okay, so let's have a listen to first without, then with.
So could you hear how the snare was smackier? Um, the transient was more uh, more apparent and also just kind of smackier sounding. And also um, those upper mids in the snare were more apparent. And the horn was just a little pushed forward to the front of the mix where it would want to be um, without being louder and just more lush and kind of velvety in tone. Okay, so let's have a go through now and see how this works. Now they've had to listen to it a bit, but we will be listening to it more. Um, and I'm going to be moving these controls around so you can hear a lot more about what each of these sections does. But first I want to look at the signal flow. Because one of the things that's unique about this, one of the many things that's unique about this plugin is that they have modeled seven different transformers in here. And transformers, particularly as my understanding of it, transformers are particularly reactive with each other and with the circuit. And they react particularly uh, intricately with the input signal, its frequency, content, transient content, level content, and all that kind of thing. And so they are a key part of the sound of analog gear and in particular this this console. So let's just go through the different transformers they've got in here. And they haven't just modeled transformers, they've modeled op amps as well. So we'll cover that too. So starting at the beginning, we've got this input control and this drives a input transformer. So the more you turn this up, the more it drives that transformer, turn it down, drives it less. Now, driving more isn't better it's just different. The more you drive it, the response of the transformer to the input material changes. Drive it less, it doesn't mean it's less transformery or less goodness happens, it's just different. So you've got a lot of range of subtle control here over the sound and also it's going to drive harder into the next transformer and that is located at the EQ because the signal flow goes from here to the input of the EQ. So if your EQ is instantiated, so you can turn it off and on here, it has its own input transformer model and that gets driven as you turn this up as well. So it's doing two things at once. Driving two different transformers at once, this control is my understanding of it. Now within this, you've also got op amps and they get driven too. And in fact, you've got the modeled op amps of the uh, API unit, but you've also got an alternative set of op amps modeled here. If you click on this mod one, mod two, that changes the op amp model that they've modeled. So the op amps in here are obviously driven harder with more input, but also by driving the different um, EQ bands. As you drive these more, you are going to get more saturation out of the op amps. And Interestingly, if you change this to this affects the gain and not just the gain, I'll explain. So this is the, the normal gain here. If you go here, it gives you half the gain and here it gives you a quarter of the gain. Now, that doesn't just change the gain. It also changes the Q. The Q behaves differently when you have these at different settings, but it also changes the saturation. So even at less gain, you will get more saturation per gain amount than you would here. So here you get a certain amount of saturation as you turn it up uh, per dB here and here you're going to get more saturation with less gain happening on that knob. So that's an interesting thing. Now you've got an output control here. This is a clean out, but it feeds the next transformer, um, which is in this area here. And this for me is one of the most interesting and kind of key areas of the plugin is this part here, this eight channel and two channel. So this has its own model transformer driven by the output of the EQ. And what's interesting here is if you change this, you get a really different model of, of the uh, circuitry of that API. Now, I don't know the details of how they model this, which circuits they modeled, but what I can tell you is that the two channel models, I think, 
just the two bus of that uh, unit, whereas the eight channel models, the way these, the eight channels of that would sum or interact with each other as they sum or interact with the two bus. I'm not sure of the details of that. But what I can tell you is that this is where one of the key parts of the sound resides. If you move this from here to here, you get a really interesting difference. This one is up the two channel. It's more a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more forward. So if that's what you need for the mix, then that's what you'd obviously want to choose. Whereas this sounds, the sound stage is a bit deeper. It's a bit wider and things are back a little bit more because there's a deeper sound stage. So again, that might be what your mix needs. It just totally depends on the music. But this is a really key one here, I find, for that kind of um, sort of secret sauce of what this plugin does. Now, after this, it goes to another, the seven in total, another transformer that's here at the line amp. Now, this line amp models is modeled after a Fairchild compressors, transformers and tubes. And the way it was modeled was with no compression. So the threshold is, is all the way up. So it's not doing any, any compression, but it's still going through all the circuitry. So you're getting all of that um, transformer and inductor and tube or valve uh, circuitry modeled. Now, if you turn this off, my understanding is that you still get the transformers and inductors of the Fairchild, but you don't get the tubes. So it's still going to be a lot of analog modeling there, but here it adds in the tubes. So that's another transformer that um, is going to get driven. If you drive this harder, it's going to drive that harder, which is going to drive that harder. From here, it goes to the compressor, input of the compressor, another transformer. Now, this compressor, even if you're not compressing like we have it here, it still has a sound. And it's also got an output which drives another um, transformer. So the compressor, first it goes through the filters and then it goes the A to the AD. Um, and there's another transformer, I can't remember exactly where, but there's another transformer that this drives into. I'm not sure whether it's before the a to D or after the A to D, well, it won't be after it, will it? It's somewhere in here, but basically it drives another transformer. So as you push this level up, you're going to saturate again a different in a different way. So after this A to D converter here, and this is another interesting one, it's in the same sort of way that the A channel and two channel thing here affects the forwardness and sound stage, so does this. And Again, this this one here sounds a bit more a bit more center focused and a bit more forward. So if that's what your mix needs, that would be a good way to go. And this one sounds a bit more open, a bit more three D sounding, uh, a little bit more laid back, you could say. So again, if that's what your mix needs, you've got that option. These are subtle differences, but they definitely are there, along with those here. So in combination, you've got a lot. Of possibilities there and with the different amount of drive you can do all the way along through the chain there's a lot of variation there all pretty subtle but you know when you a b it as you've heard it's you definitely here and i haven't even started really pushing it yet so now what have i covered i haven't covered some of the extra controls here and that is that up here you've got something which I think is an overall kind of variation on modeling the overall saturation of the API. And this is the model after how, ex how it actually sounds, but it's fairly on the aggressive side as a, as a console, especially when you drive it. Whereas you might not necessarily want that. So if you click here and you get the kind of smooth line, it basically pulls back on the, the saturation or the kind of like aggressiveness of the sound of the console, which can be useful depending on the material you've got. So again, in combination here, you've got a lot of options here. This one here affects the sound stage. With it on, it's, it's a little bit deeper and wider. With it off, it's more center focused. So again, in combination with this one here, you've got a lot there. Very subtle, but it adds up. 
Um, and then finally here, I think it's the final bit here, I think I've covered everything else uh, in terms of like what affects the kind of um, tone other than, you know, we haven't covered the EQ and compressor, but I'll do that in a minute. This is, they call the hammer, and this, um, I, it, as my understanding, is a frequency dependent saturation. And it's, they call it the hammer because it affects the, the punch um, of, I think, the low end and the lower mids. Um, and there's two different settings, the half on, the full on, and then off. By default, it's off. So it's something, I think, in addition to the sound of the console, that they just found was a kind of cool, useful, extra thing they could add in. Um, I don't know if I mentioned about these converters. Um, the, I mentioned about the sound, but what they're actually modeling is two different A to D converters, which is just an integral part of any analog um, piece of gear now, unless you're staying 100% analog, which of course you never are going to do because it's always going to end up in the digital realm for people to listen to. Um, you're going to have to have an A to D converter at some point along the chain. Um, so that's a key part of the sound now. And this is two different A to D converters. They, they even the very high end ones all have a different sound to them. Again, it's subtle, but it's, it is there. And that's, that's what these are. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, what else have we got here? Um, so yeah, we can move on to the EQ. So this is model off the, e e the API EQ. So it's got proportional Q. The higher you boost it, the tighter the Q gets. Um, and you've just got the usual preset API ranges here. And you can go from shelf to peak on the low and the high. And then you've got two mid-range ones. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, but what I would say isn't, as you'll hear, is it's really got a great sound. It, you can push these things right up to 12 dB and they still sound really good, never sounds harsh or strident. The low end is just something special, which we'll hear. Um, and the mid-range, of course, API is famous for its really uh, kind of velvety nice mid-range. Um, and that's all beautifully modeled here. Um, and then we've got um, these filters and the filters don't come directly after the EQ despite being sitting here next to them. Um, they happen much later in the signal chain, but that's not uh, uh, a problem for how it works. It's, it's by design, obviously. So we've got, these are uh, high pass filters here in gray and they've got a bump on them. so. They're shaped to in accentuate um, the low end in a nice way, and they are very nicely uh, tailored to sounding nice with this EQ, and how this EQ curves are, the two together give you really nice shapes. It's the same thing if you want to do high pass, sorry, low pass up here. Um, they have a shape and a bump that interacts in very nicely with the EQs here. So, and we'll have a listen to all of that. So, um, finally, we've got the compressor. And here, these compressors are really, uh, it's, I say compressors because there's kind of, there's two ratios. It's really one compressor, but um, I think they, the, whether they have different actual circuit models with these two ratios, I think maybe they do. Um, but it's a combination. It isn't modeled after one compressor in particular. It's a combination of compressor styles put together to give a really great compressor for subtle glue. And so it's it's not kind of aimed at heavy compression. It's aimed at the, the ratios are very low on this. Um, so what it is just superb at, I find, is just giving that kind of glue and subtle movement to the music. It's just the way that automatic, it's got automatic release on it and the way that that manages to just hold on to the uh, rhythm of the music and the, and the transient uh, envelopes is just really, really nice. So this is great on its own. It's fantastic sounding. Okay, so I think that's everything. The only other thing I haven't covered is that when you um, 
move. Oh, the bias. I haven't covered that. So that's the final bit of tone controlling you've got, and it's, it's a major one. So this changes the bias of the circuit, um, and they call it sort of hotter as you move this way and cooler as you move this way. Um, it doesn't do the same thing as driving the input. It changes the sound. It does increase the saturation as you, as you move up, as you move down. It's not like it just gets rid of the saturation. It just changes the reactivity of the plugin in a, in a model after how the circuits work, uh, depending on how the bias works. Um, so it does drive harder as you do this. In a sense, it makes it harder sounding like the input does, but in a very different way. It doesn't change the level, whereas the input here, the output here, and the output here do change the level. Now, this one is linked if you hold down shift to the output, which is really handy so that you can have it level matched. And the same thing here, if you move this one, it is really handily linked to it. This one isn't at the moment. I'm hoping that they're going to link this one too so that you can also, because this one drives another uh, transformer. So it would be nice to be able to drive this uh, and have the volume come down as you drive it up or up as you bring it down. All right, so let's start now. I'm going to start messing with some of the controls. Um, I'll start with the EQ and then we can move on to some of the other the compressor and moving around some of these other controls here. Okay, here we go. to mention that if you hold down option and command um, or alt and command um, it just mutes as you move your mouse over it's a little bit unusual but it mutes it, it bypasses these different uh, bands and then if you let up they all come back on um, I'd quite like it if you could just click on them to with the thing with the key command to turn them off and then click again to turn it on because it's sometimes you know useful to do that but anyway it's great that you can you can bypass them
So that's the whole chain here. I've, I've, I've boosted uh, the top end here. You can see that really brings out all that um, air and um, I've got it on a shelf here and kind of uh, excitement and presence in the in the frequencies in a, in a really nice way. Boosted a bit here 1.5 um, for the mid-range just because it sounded nice and cut in the bit of mud here. Now the low end is something really nice on this one. I boosted it really high just so you could hear it, but I'm going to do that again. Just have a listen to those bass frequencies and how really nice that that sounds. Um, and in terms of the compressor here, I didn't mention that there's a gain reduction right here that goes on when it's working and you can see the amount of gain reduction up here. But the attack and release are automatic. And when you move these, it just kind of biases that automatic to be a bit slower or a bit faster. Um, so you don't need to worry about setting these in any obvious way, which is also why the numbers below don't relate to kind of milliseconds or anything like that. Okay, so I'm going to do a bit more. Um, I'll show you the low end on this a bit more and then work with the compressor a bit more. I mean, that low end is just, it's amazing to my ears. I can't think of another EQ I've got that has that low end sounds like that when you boost it like that. Um, a digital EQ would not sound like that. Um, it's something about the saturation that's being added when you boost it. And I suspect it's not just the saturation. I suspect there's a lot more going on around how that saturation interacts with the the frequency and transient. Um, I think that's probably the key and having spoken to the, um, the developer um, on this, it, it does seem like a lot of the key is how this stuff interacts dynamically with the input signal. So it isn't just like, oh, we're going to add this set of harmonics here. It's how all of that changes in real time depending on a whole bunch of factors about the nature of the audio material in real time um, and how it pushes and pulls against the transformers, other transformers and, and the rest of the circuit. So all I can say is all of that aside, and, and again, that's all coming from talking to develop this developer and, um, you know, having read around a bit, I, but I am not an electrical engineer. so. Uh, this is just take that, you know, w with that in mind. Um, I don't understand the details of the ins and outs of circuitry or anything like that. Um, however, listen to the sound of this boosted at 12 and just how lush and wonderful it sounds and how the, the weight that just goes right down here in such a nice way. It's in no way is it is it boomy or or resonant. A lot of the trouble I find when boosting the low end with bass there, not just the kick drum, but bass, is you get these resonances that are just, to my ear, really unpleasant sounding. Um, and it's very difficult to get that kind of weight without a huge amount of booming and blooming of the frequencies going on that just d destroys everything. That's just not happening with this. It's just a wonderful kind of um, velvety kind of deep low end. So let's have a bit more of a play with that. Again, you'll have to have speakers that go down pretty low to hear this. My speakers go right the way down. So the, the sub going from this is, is pretty astonishing. You may, may not hear it depending on your listening system.
So again, just listening to that compressor and just how nice it sounds, even when you're driving it pretty hard. Um, it just hugs, hugs the music and pulls it together in a really nice way. Um, and obviously when I A beat it, there's a lot going on now, but you know, it's just completely transformed it, hasn't it? Um, it I thought it sounded good before I did this, but after doing this and pulling it out, it's like, oh, wow, you know, it sounds so much better now that this is in just in terms of the overall mix and how it's pulled it together and given it weight and clarity um, and um, complemented the rhythmic movement going on there. OK, I'm going to now play around with the two channel, eight channel option here um, and then these settings here. Uh, and these settings up here. I think I'm going to pull back a little bit on what I'm doing with the EQ just so I think it might be a little bit easier to hear what's going on without because there's a lot going on and you know as always with these videos I tend to push things further than I probably would just for demonstration purposes. Oh and I haven't messed with the input of the bias so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna pull back on these and then move all the more subtle controls so you can hear those. Now, that's not hitting the compressor harder. If you look at the amount of compressor going on, it's not changed. It is saturating more. It's very different. So it is, saturation is a form of compression. But if you listen to the difference, so I'm gonna move this around a bit more and you'll, you'll hear what I mean. So pushing the input, it's very extremely obvious what, what the difference in sound is. With this, it's a subtler control, but as you push it this way, it does, listen to the mid-range, listen to the transients, it does sound like that circuit is, is kind of running hotter. It's more saturated in a particular kind of way, particularly in the mid-range I'm hearing. And pulling back here, it just, it gets clearer uh, and more open sounding. Um, so there's a lot of tonal variation there on the more subtle side. So let's now move over to the two channel, eight channel. Here everything widens out when I go to the eight channel. Um, I really like that effect. But for some kinds of music, it might be nicer to have that 
slightly more center forward sound of the two channel. So I have a bit more of a play around with that. that horn just came forward when I flicked it up here and was further back before so that's what this partly what this does it's very much like a sound stage kind of thing in terms of front and back depth okay so let's move over now to the these two controls So for this track, I really think this one works better. If you listen to the kick drum and the snare, it just gets a little more solid and comes a bit more center forward. And over here, they move back just a little bit. And um, the whole thing is, again, it affects the soundstage in a subtle way, kind of doesn't obviously affect the width, but just the distance of the instruments. Um, and for some music, that might be exactly what you want, but for this, I felt it worked better on this one here. So now let's work on this one. So this is the A to D converter here, just to remind you. Uh, I'm not quite sure why it says analog here. I guess that must mean like just referring to the fact that it's going out of analog into the digital realm and back in. Um, so with the line amp here, this is basically disengaging the the tubes, the valves from the um, Fairchild circuit. Let's have a listen to that. Yeah, pretty interesting. Um, I mean, this sounds just to me, this just has a nice extra saturation flavor to it, um, which kind of moves nicely with the music, which I like. This was interesting, I found, changing the op amp configuration, which I'd forgotten to do, so I just thought, well, I'll start doing that. Um, now, with this one, um, I really heard a difference in the mid-range, um, and it seemed to just... Yeah, really quite interesting difference in that in the sound of the horn on this one. The texture of the horn just got kind of quite nicely velvety, velvety on this one, but also a little bit more aggressive um, than this one. So yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, f now, the final bit here is going to be, uh, I've got two final bits. One is to listen to these, um, which I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on here because just you know the video is going to get too long and there's just so much here. And then I'm going to try before I do that. Actually, I'm going to just drive this so you can hear what what we get when we drive this. I'm not going to drive this one because it's just too difficult to level match it. Um, but I'll, dr I'll drive this just to hear what this sounds like.
Yeah, that's super nice. So when I drive that, I'm hearing that the, the low end, the kick and the bass get really kind of compacted together um, in a nice way. And the, the horn gets a little kind of, um, a little bit more uh, aggressive sounding, but in a very, very kind of nice velvety kind of way, which this entire plugin sounds like that. You can't make this thing sound harsh or kind of over distorted. Every time you drive it into saturation, you get this kind of velvety, lush niceness out of it. Um, and when I pull this back, I'm getting more um, sort of openness in the bass frequencies. The transient's a little bit more apparent and, and the bass frequencies are allowed to open out a little bit more um, in kind of width, I guess the best way to describe it, which depending on the track might or might not be what you're after, but you've got that variation. Um, so yeah, a lot of really nice variations here and you don't need to have any compression going on. I'm only a tiny bit going on here. Anyway. You don't need to have any in order for that to work. It's just the output driving the next transformer in the chain. All right, now I'm gonna finally have a go with these. So you can see what these do. Just to remind you, this smooths out the overall um, aggressiveness of the circuit and this works with the soundstage a bit the widening and this adds this is a kind of extra bit of adding on some extra punch Hopefully you can hear what all those things did. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this into the B section and I'm going to set it up, go to the B section, I'm going to set it up here with this off so that it's more center focused, this on full which is going to give it a bit more punch and also I'm going to go for the more punch setting here and I'm going to now A, B those to see what that's like. So I'll start with the A with all those things set like this and then I'll jump over to the B so you can hear them all changing at the same time. So quite a difference when I switched between those two. It got way more center focused and the other way with those with these on with that off and the these on, it's it's definitely wider and and not as kind of you know aggressively driving forward. So yeah, the amount of variation you've got in this thing is just huge and it sounds great on any setting you have it on. So you've basically got a whole range of like can't go wrong, can't make it sound bad uh, variations here. I mean, I have to say that, you know, this is a real achievement. The sound of this thing to my ears is um, it's definitely got that magic that you get out of certain bits of gear. And it's I can only think of maybe one or two other ones that uh, Michelangelo from Tone Projects, I find brings some of this as well, uh, or, or a lot of this in a different way. Um, but yeah, they're very few and far between. And I really think it's the dedication of certain uh, developers to really trying to go beyond um, just a kind of 
fairly straightforward emulation into trying to really capture that extra couple of levels, like the full, the full whammy, as it were, of what's going on inside um, these circuits and how they, they interact and kind of live and breathe with the, the material. I think that's the thing, maybe that's the way I would describe it, is that when you do get a really nice piece of analog gear, in mastering, for example, and sometimes in, in mixing as well with like a console, um, something that's affecting the whole mix is that um, you get this kind of living, breathing thing where it seems to be moving with the music and it seems to be changing what it's doing in a very kind of subtle way around what it's getting from the music from kind of millisecond to millisecond, which you just don't really get from plugins normally. And again, I don't think that's necessarily a problem, um, but it's nice to have. Uh, and this really brings that. Um, it's fantastic. It, yeah, just hats off to the dedication of uh, Zayed, the developer, and uh, Mark Daniel Nelson for for working so hard to get this where it is. So yeah, I hope you find this useful. Um, I highly recommend this. Um, and yeah, um, if you found this useful and interesting, please, as usual, give the video a like and subscribe. Um, press the thanks button if you can. And hope to see you next time.